So uh, this was the histogram for the quiz. You see this long tail? My guess is these are all those partial submissions that people had on hand. So you can't have so many people getting here. At 1159, a whole bunch of, on Saturday night, a whole bunch of people found your quiz being magically submitted for you. If you had it open. So you're, you're being represented down there. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, so if you happen to be in this section, and if this is your score, you're going to have to do something about it at that the bottom. Because clearly it's not fair for us to be even a, to make a score, right? So we're, it's not fair for us to be evaluating on something that is really in the But let us know. You just happen to be in there below the 70%. If it's about 70%, I'm going to believe that that is a valid score. Uh, the uh, mean score was 12.46. Mm -hmm. The standard deviation was 2.68, so you have people that are taking 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and for the most part, mm -hmm. most people got 100%, as you can see. Uh, not, not the majority, but the largest one. The plurality of the class got 100%. Mm -hmm. And of course, the WAP got 100%. Now, uh, well, we're also, we have had several questions about projects. We're going to hear about us, uh, about projects sometimes this week. Uh, one of the reasons we haven't actually begun talking about projects yet is that I want this uh, business of the registration in the past to sort of settle down. So, you know, who has any questions when we're working on a project like this? Let's see if we can think of people who can think of last week. One of the clocks. Any questions? Okay, a quick recap. Here's where we were. You can see stuff that we know. I'm going to be off on the side for a bit. Uh, we said neural networks can do pretty much everything these days that are associated with the uh, you know? We saw here were all the tasks. Uh, uh, this is speech recognition, translation, playing games, uh, <coughs> describing images, self driving cars. They have uh, they're quite automated by using uh, increasingly using neural networks. This one is uh, painting, uh, doing painting from different styles, creating art, uh, lots of things that neural networks are able to do. And we, we figure that these are all human tasks. So if you, you know, if you want to set about the task of building a machine that can do these tasks, you want to mimic the record. You want to specifically mimic the network structure of the <coughs> And the brain, we said, had was a network of elements of this kind, where each element was a little neuron which got signals from many other neurons and fired if the incoming complete incoming signal exceeded some pressure. Okay. And we said this is just everything that we saw in the last class. So there's going to be a certain degree of overlap with the last class today, simply because the last class was the interval. Now Here's how we model the whole thing computation. This was the computational model for a single neuron. You had uh, inputs, several inputs, and uh, each is associated with each input was a weight. What if the combined weighted sum of all of the inputs exceeded a threshold, the neuron would fire. If it didn't, the neuron would not fire. And the behavior of this unit was completely determined by the pattern of weights. We saw that. I change the weights. I can get an R gate or an AND gate or a maturity gate or whatever you want, right? Now, the multi-linear perceptron was just a network of these guys, uh, which had the, which connected all of these units, these, these elements in base. So here again, this is the basic gate that we were speaking of. Many inputs. Each of them gets weighted. We sum the lot if it exceeds the threshold. That's the basic perceptron, right? It's also uh, electrical engineer, we're going to call this. How many of you are uh, electrical engineers? These are just some way of the term, threshold gate, right? This is a standard uh, computer scientists call these perceptrons, electrical engineers call them threshold gates. Computer scientists also call it threshold gates and uh, designed an entire new uh, field of complexity, arithmetic complexity, around threshold gates called PC. That's why we have AC, which is arithmetic circuits, and uh, you know, P and NP and what that's like. So here is uh, a better thing. Instead of saying <coughs> the okay. 
instead of saying uh, the weighted sum of inputs must exceed a threshold, I can just call the threshold another parameter, right? And the sum of the weighted inputs plus the threshold. Here I put a minus here because the weight here I'm proceeding. Weight I have here is one. If that exceeds, if that is positive, I'm going to pass. Right, well, this is the same thing that we had. Okay? Now, this is a this is not really what you would do in a real neural network as we know it. What you're going to have is something else in this class. You wouldn't have a strong pressure. You would typically have something that's soft. The output is not going to be binary. It's not going to be zero or one. It's probably, you know, the earliest versions of this model, you had a sigmoid over there where the output was between zero and one. And so this weighted sum plus the pressure of the was to guys, do you mind shutting your laptops? Even if you are looking at slides, please. Uh, so laptops. So, uh, so now the output is going to be between some. You're, you're, what you're really doing is applying some function to the sum of weighted inputs, and you get an output. If that function happens to be a sigmoid, the output is going to be between zero and one. But you can have other functions like a panage. In which case the output is going to be between minus one or what is popularly known as the rectified linear unit, where the output is always going to be positive. So the weighted sum plus time combination of the weighted sum and the threshold is negative, it won't there's nothing coming out. Otherwise, whatever comes in comes in the out as it's or a soft version of it. All of these are different variables. So today's <coughs> discussion, I'm going to continue assuming that there are functions that is Pressure. Not any of these soft outputs, a pressure. And if we have time in the last few minutes, we're going to go back and revisit what happens. If we replace a threshold gate with it uh, with an activation that's continuous. Now, again, recap the multi layer perceptron. We didn't explicitly mention this terminology, so that's why I have this slide. If I connect all of my many of these uh, perceptrons or these neural units, in one big network, eventually you're going to see some outputs, and then you're going to have many internal uh, internal components, also the same element, basic element, repeated over and over again. The simplicity of the structure is what makes it so useful, right? All of these are essentially the same element. These are all things whose outputs you will not actually see. You're only going to see the output that comes out here, so these are the hidden units. And typically, you're going to arrange them in layers like so, and so we call it a multi-layer perceptron. The sacrifice that I make, I'm boiling inside with my feet Anyway, uh, so. Now, all of this is just old stuff. The terminology you keep hearing is deep networks. What do we mean by saying deep in this case? What is there a technical definition for depth? And the answer is yes. Anybody familiar with it? Yes. Deep is actually a term that's associated with graphs of any kind. So how many of you are taking that picture? What's a deep graph? Anyone? Matt? Well, I was just going to say the depth is the longest path. Exactly, right? So the depth of a graph is the length of the... If I have a directed graph, the depth of a graph is the length of the longest path from source to destination. So here I have two graphs. In the first case, this is everything is directed. All paths start from here and go here. I have one path which is just one leg long. But there's a longer path which is two legs long. So the depth of that first path is two. The one to the right, what is the depth of that graph? <coughs> you can't see it. I could raise the screen, but it's going to get predicted out there. So uh, this is got the longest path is three legs long, right? So this is a depth tree graph. 
Now, if I have a multi-layer process gone, or if I have a network of process gone, it's not just a graph, it's directed. Things are going to have source of depth. Right? So in this case, what could the depth be? So here, for example, what is the depth of this network? Okay, the depth is 3, right? 1, 2, 3. Any time I have a depth more than 2, I'm going to call it deep. So 3 or more is a deep network. There's a, sorry, there's no hand waving here. It's a very clear yeah, this one, definition. Right? Now, yes? If you have a loop, it's no longer a right? In that sense, in that case, the notion of depth doesn't really arise, but that's a completely different class of structure that we will talk about later. But for the most depth, when you perform regular computations, you're not waiting for the network to start ringing, right? You give it an input, it produces an output. Things don't keep going back in. So, all right. Now, we also briefly mentioned this. What kind of relationships can a network of this kind compute? Remember, to compute Boolean functions, to compute real value functions. That could compute pretty much any Boolean function. And who was it who corrected my figure? One of you corrected my figure. Mm -hmm. You know, it was you. Thank you. Right. I put I had a one over here, and then it And then I fixed that code and code. I made it a three, and that was a mistake. Thanks, mistake. Anyway, uh, so I can pretty much compose any Boolean function with networks of these units. We saw that in the last class. Correct. Right? I can also compute any. Uh, function of a single of, of, of a scalar variable with networks of this kind. The network just gets incredibly large. So I can do two networks. Maybe you should get some shares in the next one. Okay. So, but, so what are the limitations? Exactly how much can I come This is what we're going to be focusing on today. We're going to be looking at multi-layer perceptrons as universal Boolean functions. Mm -hmm. Where is the need for that? We look at multi-layer perceptrons as universal classifiers, the universal approximators. In all of these, we're going to be talking about the notion of depth and width. We'll revisit depth and width later also in the class, in the course, several lectures from now. Today, I'm just uh, giving, we are talking about it at a very conceptual level, and to be completely honest, if you go back and look at these slides really carefully, you'll find that I've lied every single minute of this class. So that's okay. This is meant to explain things to you, right? Jerry was the guy who did that last time. Yes, anyway. He had three people in class, he's the only guy who found out. Now, let's talk to <laughs> So this is a clue. If you, want to, if you want to find mistakes in what I've done, please go back and get me. Let's go first. Let's look at uh, multi-layer perceptrons as Universal Boolean functions. And then for that. Okay. How well do NLPs model Boolean functions? Now we've already seen that a perceptron can model S, an AND gate, right? An OR gate, a NOT gate. If you can pose any Boolean function, one can have these gates. Okay? Here's something more it can do. This is a universal AND. So I want this to fire only if these guys are on and these guys are off. Any combination, any definite combination, any, right? Any any conjunction, I can define. And you see how this does this? All of these have weight one. All of these have weight minus one, right? If any one of them becomes non-zero, it becomes one. It's going to set the minus one over here, right? If any one of these is off. Then, this, then their contribution to the sum is going to become less than L. But if all of them are on, the sum is going to be L. If any one of these is on, the sum is going to become less than L. So if I have a threshold of L, it's only going to fire if the first L are on and the remaining are all on. This is the only condition under which it will fire. Right? So this is a universal L gate. Here's a universal R gate. If it, this one's going to fire, if any of these guys is on, of any of these guys is zero. Can you see how that happens? Right? So if any one of these is zero, if any one of these is zero, so if I sum all of them, assume all of them are one, right? Or let's take the worst case. 
Assume all of these are zero and all of these are one. What would the threshold be? The, the resulting in, I mean, what would the resulting input be? The resulting input is going to be just however many times I have over here, correct? So if any one of them flips sign, the resulting sum is going to be one more than that, right? And that will be my threshold. And so this guarantees that this will fire if any of the top two are one or any of the bottom two are zero. Easy. Now here's something else. This is a generalized majority rule. So basic majority rate, if I wanted to define the majority rate where I said I want at least k of my n inputs to be one, then that's very easy. All I'm gonna have is uh, something like this. I have my x1 to xn. All of these have a rate. And the threshold is going to be k. So if any k at all is going to uh, fire, right? <coughs> so if k is greater than n over 2, that's a majority. So that's it. And this is done with a single uh, percent. Mark. Whereas if you were trying to build a Boolean circuit for this, that's going to take an exponential number of times. So. Man, it's okay. It's, it's very. The last time, you know, there were people hanging outside my class, the police turned up. So I don't know. <laughs> really. Uh, now, so I can even make it more complex. I can say that if the sum of the number of entries here that are one and the number of entries that are here that are, is, is, that are zero is k or, or more, it must fire, right? So it's a generalized majority. We have all kinds of crazy things that this thing can do. This little puts a term, but it can't do an XOR. And for an XOR, we are going to need a multi layer processor, right? We saw this in the last one. And we saw, of course, you know, which day, there is one there. I still have a one. I should fix this. Uh, that it can compose pretty much any Google layer. Now here's my question. So, so these guys, multi-layer perceptrons, are universal Boolean functions. They can compose any Boolean function at all. That's why they're universal. Right? <coughs> now, you know, both of these designs, or even in the case of the XR, you had one hidden layer. In the case of the XR, you had one hidden layer, right? <coughs> and then you had an on layer. For the function that I have over here, I have two hidden layers. And for this guy, I have what three hidden layers, and then I have an output. So four layers here, three layers there. If I want to model any Boolean function at all, how many layers do I need? Anyone? One hidden layer. How do I do that? Anybody else? Why would one hidden layer do? Anyone? A single perceptron cannot model any Boolean function. A single perceptron can model any conjunction. Right? And so the reason what, what we're going to do is, what is a Boolean function? A Boolean function is just a few scale, right? You can list out every uh, combination of inputs that's going to provide, produce a one. You don't even need to list the ones that are going to produce zero. This is completely specified. The function. Or you can do the inverse and list out every combination that produces a zero and skip the rest, right? So now here, this is the same. This represents all input combinations because Boolean things can be enumerated. You can call it a two one. Then. A Boolean function can be represented as a, what is this form for? Anyone? Some of our, say, B and F formula, right? A disjunctive normal form. So, we are basically each, each term over here. Right. Now, consider this one. This says the output is going to be 1. If x1 is 1, x2 is 0, x3 is 0, x4 is 0, and x5 is 1. So the Boolean function for this line is x1 not and not x2 and not x3 and not x4 and x5. 
right? So this guy is going to be not x1 and not x2 and x3 and x4 and not x5. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six such entries. Any one, if any one of them happens, that even the, the, the uh, network is fine, right? So now for each of these conjunctions, I can have a little perception because the perception can be a conjunction, right? So this is going to be my conjunction, my perception for the first guy, for my second guy, third guy, fourth guy, fifth guy, sixth guy, and all the lines. A single hidden layer can model any odd Boolean function. Yeah? Okay. So not only is a, is a multi-layer perceptron a universal Boolean function, a one hidden layer, uh, multi-NLP, a two-layer NLP is a universal Boolean function. Quite mm -hmm. nice. But then, you can't just, <coughs> for those who can't see it, I'll read this up. That's not a satisfying answer, right? How many perceptrons does this function need? Do this network need in the very layer? And if I'm trying to do the entire function using just one hidden layer, how many perceptrons do I require in that one hidden layer? And, uh, are you? Take it N plus one. N plus one, that's for? You had six because you had six rows in the table. If I had seven rows, I'd have one more, right? You're going to have as many entries as you have conjunctions in the table. Right? And but then that's not an easy answer, right? That's not that's that's not really it. Those conjunctions don't need to be individually enumerated. Why is that? How many of you have heard of a carbon map? Anybody who this is why you should take electrical engineering and not computer science. It's a useless subject. <laughs> or electrical engineers have heard of carbon maps. Now, this one is uh, a truth table. This figure to the left on the on the uh, screen. This is a truth table over two over four edges. So this the inputs are W, X, Y, and Z in my representation. So W, X can take four possible combinations. Y, Z can take four possible combinations. The 16 boxes represent all 16 possible combinations. I'm highlighting the boxes where the output is one and leaving the boxes where the output is zero black. Okay? Now observe something over here. These things have been arranged in a topological manner. So if I go from one column to the other, only one bit changes. <coughs> Both bits do not change, right? So this means look at If I go from here to here, Z flip, right? If I go from here to here, Y flip. If I go from here to here, Z flip. If I go from here back to here, Y flip. So the two edges are connected. This is a donut. <coughs> the top and the bottom are connected. The left and the right are connected. The standard figure is called a polygon. Now, these, these four boxes are all connected to one another, right? Which means that it doesn't matter whether W, X is what the value of W, w and X are. The output is always going to be the same. The output in this case only depends on Y, Z. I can, if I did a basic DNF formula, I could have seven boxes here, I need seven units. But I can group these guys together. If I group these guys together, I'm telling, I'm basically, I'm saying the output is one, is one if I, if y and z are both zero, correct? I can group these two guys together because because I know that these two only vary in z, and the value of z does not matter, right? So this is going to be not w x and not y, right? These two guys are connected. Similarly, I can group them together, and so although I had seven boxes. The actual DNF formula only has three terms, and those three terms don't all have every single variable in it. So by grouping things together, I can actually make a one-layer perceptron, multi-layer perceptron, or the one-layer medium network much smaller. But can I always do this? Anyone? What is the condition under which I can never do this? Uh, that's one condition. Yes. But what 
is the worst case, yes? Chess board, right? So this was my figure for this guy. But if I want to have the largest irreducible BNF formula, that's going to be this. There's no way I can going to be I'm going to be able to group any two functions. So this will need, in this case, eight perceptrons to to com to, to uh, represent using just a two-layer method. So how many neurons in a DNF formula? MLP for the Boolean function, this is going to be by nine, including the final number, right? <coughs> I can expand my final uh, <coughs> map to the three dimensions. So this actually has one, two, three, four, five, six variables. Okay. I satisfy the same property. These are four dimensional code, I can visualize it. These are connected in all which ways. But by alternating stuff, now I'm giving you a function which is a that cannot be reduced. Okay. In this case, how many perceptrons will I require in my one hidden layer to uh, represent this in these two layers? Okay. Mm -hmm. Where did you get 49? Mm -hmm. No, 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 the six there's this, this has 64 fields, right? 16 times four. Half of them are black. So that's going to be 32, correct? Plus P, alpha. So that's going to be 32. This would require 32. Generically, if I have a very function of, okay, not you. If I have a function of n inputs, how many perceptrons will I require in the hidden layer? I wonder this, I have one hidden layer. Anybody? Two raised and two raised to n minus one plus one. If I want to do all of this in uh, the hidden layer is going to require two raised to n, two raised to n minus one neurons, correct? It's exponential in n. If I want to do the whole thing using just one hidden layer, this is exponential in n, and that is not right? But then, or uh, so, uh. The real number parameters that you count are not the number of neurons, the number of wires, edges. And each neuron here has n inputs in the first hidden layer, right? So you're going to have n times 2 raised to n minus 1 weights. That's how many parameters you're going to need to represent this network using just one technique. Okay? But then, can anybody see a pattern here? If I use multiple layers, how many will how many I use? Do you see a pattern there? Yes, you see a pattern. It's a test. Right? right? Anything more than that? <clears throat> What's a test board including logic? What's a test board including logic? It's a parity function, right? If the sum of the inputs, if you just sum all the values, and if the sum is, if you sum all the bits as the input, if the sum is even, you're going to have a zero, if you sum the bar, you're going to have one, you the next one, correct? It's a parity function, which is, and I just told you the answer, it's an XR. This is what it is, right? That guy is WXR, X, XR, Y, XR, Z. This is a UXR, VXR, WXR, X, Y, Z. Now, if I do this using multiple layers, how many networks, how many neurons are I going to require? You must know how many you need for an XR. Correct? So, that's my XR. So, each here, I can XR W and X. That's going to need three neurons. That result can be XR with Y. That's going to need three more neurons. That result is going to be XR with Z. That's going to need three more neurons. I only need three times the nine neurons in this case. It's not a big, you know, huge benefit when you have only four input variables. Let's say I go to six input variables, and that's the difference between two. Why can't you do them parallel? Together. Right? So I'm just explaining this. So now this is UXRV. I can 
x y that the result with w, I can x y the result with x, I can x y the result with y, I can x y the result with z. I'm going to have how many neurons do I need? I'm going to need three neurons for every all n diamond inputs except one. The first guy is not solved anything, right? So this is going to be three times n minus one. Which is going to be 45 perceptrons. And each perceptron has only two minutes except 45. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So you can see. Now I just went up the difference went up there in the one case we had the number of perceptrons of order uh of this n minus one. The other case it was just adding layers. Goes makes the network go from being exponentially large to many in size. So that's where the work is going to get from. And of course, so yeah, more generally, an x of n really will be times n minus one times n minus one times n minus one times n minus one times which is basically what we saw. But if I do this, but so comparing what you can do with a single hidden layer. The, output, the size of the network is exponential in n. If I add that, it becomes linear. Right? Okay. And getting to your point, that's not the best way to represent it. Whereas the XRs are commutative, right? Probably they can add associated. So I can begin grouping them together in any which way. <coughs> which means I can XR the first two, I can XR the second two, and then I can XR the results. I can do the same thing over again. I can keep exoring things together in pairs, which means that I don't need, in the earlier case, for n inputs, I, need, I, I had a depth of n. Here, the depth is log n, right? So, but just going from one layer to log n layers reduces the size of my network from exponential, potentially reduces the size of my network. From exponential to linear. Of course, you've got to build the network just right. If you don't, it's still going to be right? Now, let's <coughs> challenge the depth. Suppose instead of building, so this, this, suppose instead of building the entire network, I decided that at this point, I'm going to have one, only one more layer, one more hidden layer. What happens? The output is an XR over these guys, correct? The same logic applies. So if, if I decide that I'm going to have only one more layer after the third layer, the fourth layer is basically performing an XR over the output of the third layer, right? And how many neurons will be required if you want to just perform an XR with only one layer? Exponential. Here it's going to be exponential in the number of terms I have there, which is basically eight terms. Make sense to you guys? So, trying to, so here is the thing, if I simply reduce this, the minimum size, depth of the network that I required over here was log n, or 2 times log n, right? If I decide to go, I can keep shrinking the depth of the network from n all the way to log n, and keep getting the correct result without having an exponential blow up in my circuit, it's going to stay linear. But once I go just below the optimal depth, the circuit is going to blow up and become exponential results. Just to be able to compute the function. Either that or it won't compute the function properly. Okay. Questions? Okay. This transformation itself costs money and so forth. So this is the, you're, you're, you're going into this whole domain of uh, uh, circuit complexity and, uh, and uh, complexity. You, you can't just transform one problem to the other and say the transformation happens. You have to worry about the cost of the transformation itself. That circuit is going to become exponentially large. So 
you know, it becomes cheap there, but everything has to be transformed in this kind of way. There's more the more generic stuff coming up, I know, right? So recap the need for that, these booty and multi-layer perceptrons that skip linear in this number of inputs can become exponentially large using only one. Okay. Now it gets worse. If I have any kind of MFP and uh, at some point the subsequent function is an XOR over the over the partial outputs or the delivery outputs. At that point, if you don't have sufficient depth beyond that point, you're going to have an exponential process. So this is sort of generalizes uh, in, in, in a not very nice sort of small <coughs> sort of. The XOR is really a parity problem. And now these are all standard theorems that, that are you know, part of the literature. Any Boolean circuit of depth B, which uses AND or and not gates, where the individual gates can have any number of inputs, right? They have this trade-off of size versus depth. So if you have, if you're working on n inputs, and if you're using a depth b, then if depth is one, the size of the network is going to be two raised to n. If depth is two, the size of the network is going to be two raised to n over two. Depth. So you're speaking of the number of inputs, right? So this is a this is a two level problem for two inputs. That's a nice cool trade-off between depth and uh, depth. These are worst case number. Now, alternately stated, if you want if you want to get all the graphic about it, you want to say that the parity problem is not an AC zero. AC zero is arithmetic circuits where the depth of the circuit is not dependent on the number of inputs, fixed depth circuit, okay? Uh, now, not all Boolean circuits have this clear depth, so getting to your question, so is this true only for chess goals, or is it for everything? Not all Boolean circuits have such clear depth versus size trade-offs, but here's a very nice theorem due to Shannon, which says that, you know, now if I have n inputs, how many Boolean uh, Boolean functions can you define over to over over n inputs? Anyone? You got it. Right? Anybody can do better than that? Two raised to two raised to n, right? Because you have two raised to n entries in the truth table, and each entry can be either zero or one. Correct. So on n inputs, I can compute, I can define two rates to two rates to n possible Boolean functions. And Shannon's theorem says that of these two rates to two rates to n, except for a handful, a really countable number, right? Every other Boolean function is going to need a circuit with two, two rates to n over n gates. I don't care how we design it. So the majority of Boolean functions in this world require exponential size circuits. Fortunately, we're not going to invert those functions for the most part. No. But, you know, here's the flip side. If all Boolean functions over n inputs could be computed using a circuit that's polynomial in size, n, then this literally means that p equals np, which is zero. Now, all right, so the summary, a multi-layer perceptron is a universal Boolean function can represent any given function, but it can only represent the function correctly if it's sufficiently wide and sufficiently deep. So you need the right combination of depth and width, otherwise it's not going to represent the function properly, right? And the optimal depth and width depend on the number of variables and the complexity of the given function. So the complexity is uh, you know, defined in terms of the minimum number of DNF terms required to represent the function. Questions? We we'll pause for a second. We can move on. Anyone? Very clear. Huh? Okay. So here, I said I was lying at every minute of the class, right? So here was line number two. I was speaking of Boolean functions. Special circuits are not Boolean functions, right?
single threshold gate can compute a majority function, right? How many, what is the size of a set, Boolean circuit that computes a majority gate? It's exponential. Whereas it can be done by a single gate. Right? So all of these results that people have on Boolean circuits don't simply transpose onto threshold circuits. It turns out, you know, proper analysis of threshold circuits is still not being performed. There's a lot, great deal of work that keeps going on. But in general, the rules that we sort of agree upon for the Boolean functions can be assumed to apply to threshold circuits as well, right? So uh, there, in fact, is a whole theory uh, on uh, the complexity of threshold circuits that we won't get into. Now, but one of the things that we would want to worry about is that when you actually worry about when people try to analyze threshold circuits, you are assuming that all the inputs are Boolean, you know, all the boots are. So the uh, circuit theory guys make, make an assumption that the inputs are Boolean and the weights are integers. But in real life, we don't deal with Boolean inputs and we don't, don't deal with the integer weights. Everything works on the real. So we have, if you really want to understand how these things operate, we have to begin considering functions over the things of real. So let's go and look at what happens over the years. We've already seen multi-layer bus at and universal classical, right? So the problem we said was that if you're trying to perform a classification task by trying to represent the bit of a image, 784 bits of image represents the digit two one. Then in 784 dimensions, the region of the space that represents inputs corresponding to the digit two is going to be some small close to at least remote of this. And what you really want is a function that says, given an input, whether the input is inside this you know, peanut or outside, right? And we know that for any function of this kind, you can build a circuit that actually computes the function, right? And we saw how we can do this. A perceptron on reals is just a linear classifier. The function really looks like this, a step function. Everything to one side of the line or the hyperplane is zero. Everything to the other side, the output is one, correct? And with a function of this kind, I can compute for really. I can compute an I can compute a not, but I cannot compute an XR. This is an XR and this is an <coughs> classic. But then we also saw how this can be used to put together more complex functions. Right? I can do a, this pentagon using five perceptrons, each of which gets one side of the pentagon. And then you are the law and get into that. Or now I can do something more complex, like this, where, like this picture here, where I want the output to be one if the input is within either of the two categories and zero outside. So in this case, what would I do? I'm going to have two sub circuits. The first one determines that the input is in the first category. The second one determines that the input is in the second category. And then I can pick, I can or the two. And now I can tell you if you put it inside either pentagon or not. Right? Very straightforward. And now I can get even more complex position boundaries. I can get this human shape. I can get a box. I can get a indescribable figure. But the way I will do it is to chop it up and you know, many of the polygons. I can build a little uh, circuit for every single polygon. I can <coughs> or the lot. And I can compose this. Really tedious decision boundary just by decomposing the problem of the, in a proper way, right? But now here is the question How many layers am I using here? Two hundred layers, right? Three layers. Can I do this with just one hand? Basically, look at this complex thing. Something like this. How would I do this using just one hand? I want to set it like the one in No. Any guesses, any needs, any suggestions? Arbitrarily close approximations are also okay. Arbitrarily close approximations are also okay. He's given all the hints and answers. <laughs> yes. Yes. But the point is 
a closed region, right? Whereas the lines are only going to get entire regions of the space. Yes. The thing is, when you create one of those small blocks, it has an effect on the rest of the space as so well. So think about this, right? So what happens? Uh, suppose I just take the five. So let's say I, I, I built a network which did this kind of thing, right? If I built the network which does this kind of thing, where is my So we saw that what happens is you had five inputs. Each of the five inputs contributed a value of one. So inside there the sum was five, right? And over here the sum was four. The sum was four. The sum was four here, and the sum was four. <coughs> now suppose I did the second one, which was this is a, this is a completely separate, different subset. It was five over here. This gives me, what is the actual sum here going to be? Is it going to be 5? If I add everything up, I'm also going to get the contribution from this guy. Right? So this will become 8 or 7 or something else. So the numbers are going to be all over the place. Correct? You can't just add them up because each of them is going to be interfering with the other. So your answer <coughs> is getting there, but we have to make it so that one of them does not interfere with the next. Right? And how can we do that? For that, let's go back and look at the square. So suppose I'm trying to build a decision boundary that's a square. This is a multi-layer process. I'm going to have four neurons. And I'm going to, the first neuron is going to fire from this line, the second one here, the third one here, the fourth one here. Then all their outputs are going to be summed out in over here. And the sum is going to be compared into a you guys can't see anything but me. That sum is going to be compared to 4, and if it matches 4, it's going to be 5. But let's look at the sum as a function of the entire space. If you look at the sum as a function of the entire space, this is the value of the sum. It's 4 inside the square. These regions are 3. These regions are 2. Okay, this is going to have a square. Now, let me do a pentagon. Right? The sum is 5 inside, 4 here, 3 here, and 2 over here. If you just look at the sum of the outputs, of the, I have 5 neurons, right? Each of them getting one side of the pentagon, add up their sum, their outputs. That's the sum. So here's the three dimensional thing. It's 5 here, 4 in these little arms, 3 over here, and 2 over here. Okay? Let me go up to a exit. <coughs> So now I have six sides, they're, they're being summed. I'm going to be comparing the output to six. And if I compare the output to six, it's going to be a one inside this hexagon, but zero everywhere else. But look at the actual values of the sum. I can't just add these guys up, because, you know, it's because of these other fellows that I get interference, right? But then as I keep increasing the number of sides, that's what I get with the heptagon. You know, if I'm trying to model the heptagon. This is what I get with approximately for something with 16 sides. Right, anybody know? Sixteen. I'm going to say it in Latin, beta hexagon, right? Or so. Yeah. Anyway, the figure gets more. It gets really pretty, right? And this is with sixteen four sides, and this is with one thousand sides, right? So what is the pattern that you observe? As you keep increasing the number of sides. It reduces the area outside this polygon whose value is greater than n over 2. Over here it's n, over here it's n over 2, and the sloping region begins to shrink. But it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. There's a nice closed form formula to this. And the formula for this function is right here. The sum of, if, as I add more and more sides, the sum, for so really log in, this is just so nicely, the sum of the Outputs has this shape, okay, which is n times so n in the middle, 1 minus uh, 1 over pi r cos mean of 1 or radius of the rectangle. So whatever the formula means, it really means that 
is going to be if I were to draw it. So let's draw it as part of the point of this. This is the center of the circle of the point. And as this width decreases, it gets steeper and steeper. In the limit, it's going to be a 90 degree cylinder. A really thin cylinder with the walls at 90 degrees. Right? And once I get something of this kind, what I'm going to get is a cylinder of this kind where the sum is not n inside and n over 2 outside. Right? All I have to do is to add another bias unit which subtracts out the n over 2. And the result is n over 2 inside and 0 outside. And now I can do what you said. They don't, they're no longer going to interfere. Right? So now if I want a design of this kind where I want the output to be 1 inside 2 of these circles and 0 everywhere else, I can do it with 1 here and there. I have one subnet which produces one cylinder. I have another subnet which produces the other cylinder. I add up their outputs. The output is going to be zero n over two within either cylinder and zero everywhere else, right? And once I do this, I can actually do this. And so it wasn't trivial, was it? This is you can do this. You can actually build any decision boundary using a neural network with only one given layer. But how many neurons are you going to require in that in there? In a extremely large, if not infinite. Right? You need that. Questions, anyone? Right, okay. So, MLPs can capture any decision boundary. A one layer MLP can capture any, any classification boundary. They are universal classifiers. But, we can, deeper networks can require far fewer neurons than shallow networks. Right? So, exactly uh, how many layers do we need? Formal analyses typically treat these things as arithmetic circuits. They compute cross polynomials over many fields. Uh, Leslie Wallian had, had a uh, theorem way back in the 90s and 80s. It's a you know, polynomial degree, and because the network of that blocks, right? And, uh, this is uh, an analysis kind of is still an open problem. So, what we're going to try to do is not look at formal analyses and then rely a bit more. And we're going to see this with figures, okay? And we're going to consider threshold activation methods. Now look at the circuit of it. This, I want a, I want a circuit which produces an output classification boundary with this thing. I want an, uh, an output of one inside the yellow and a zero inside the gray region. If I want to do this with one hidden layer, how many do I want? Do you want? Speak up. I mean, I have a cold and I'm louder than you guys. Anyone? How many neurons will I need with one hidden layer? <coughs> okay. Let's assume it's infinite, right? Now, if I use two hidden layers, how many will I need? A very small number, two of these. Why? Because the entire thing is composed of 60 lines. Line, 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 right? So I need 16 units in the first layer <coughs> to capture each of these lines. And once I capture each of these lines, so these 16 are the 16 lines, right? And then in the next layer, for each of these boxes, I'm going to need one of these neurons. This is how we can do boxes with the lines, correct? And then I can order. And so, here with uh, uh, 56 hidden new neurons, 16 in the first hidden layer, 40 in the second layer, and 57 total neurons using, including the output, I can actually produce this using two hidden layers. Right? Do I really need that many? Is there something else that's going on? And this figure looks at familiar? The test board, the next, right? If I have the 16 x lines, this is just an XOR over all 16 lines. How many neurons do I need for an XOR? 2 times 16, correct? 
So I can do this with 48 because of Now in this particular problem, it's not a big win. Uh, but if I have the lines, I can just build an X on it. Yeah, maybe we don't see the benefit. If I go to this figure, then you can see that there are many more lines and then the same thing. So one layer you need many more. But so there's 64 lines. And if I want to do this with one hidden layer, that's going to need 544 neurons in the second layer of each box. Or if I do this with X or it's a much smaller set, right? And as the complexity of the patterns keeps increasing, I'm going to find the difference between a properly structured deep network and a shallow network. So we will And we are even comparing our depth to versus deep network. So uh, here, we observe that the two-layer net uh, was quadratic in a number of lines. Actually, it was n plus b squared on a. This was an exponential. Earlier, I said, you know, if I use a less than an optimal size, I need a, the network is going to go exponential in size. It's not exponential over here. Why is that? Because these line, each line is dependent on the next line. Right? If I'm to the left of this line, if I'm to the left of this line, I'm also to the left of this line, right? The lines binds these individual patterns are not statistically independent. If they were in different dimensions, then the exponential exponentiality would be different. So uh, the <coughs> number of neurons required in a shallow network is potentially exponential in the dimensionality of the input or alternately in the statistically independent features in the input. Again, okay, all of my figures are illustrated, don't just, you know, don't take it too seriously, you're not what you this is typical decision value, it's not meant to come in and So, uh, sorry, sorry, this is just something to say. Now, let's go back to this business of MLPs as universal <coughs> application. Okay. Now, if I'm looking at continuous value regression, so remember, we said that we can MLPs can model any Boolean function. MLPs can model any classification function, right? What about continuous value function? So we saw in the case of MLPs that if I have, if it's a function of a single variable, it was easy enough. I can use a function of this kind. I can compose, I can use a network of this kind. I can compose any function with a flexible, you know, arbitrary precision. Okay? This is a function with one variable. How would I do it if I had function with two variables? Mm -hmm. We have the same issue. You can't just put polygons. Polygons will interfere with one another. So what you're going to have to do is to start off with a cylinder of this kind. I can put any number of cylinders that don't interfere. Right? Each cylinder can be scaled to the appropriate height. And then I'm going to basically fit in a pile of cylinders under the sheet. So one given layer of, you know, can model any function that I'm going to need infinite in the worst case neurons in the terminal, right? Depending on how. So everybody get it? Okay. Now here I'm making an approximation. I'm just saying that all of these outputs are going to be weighted and added, and that's how you got the continuous value function. Typically, what happens? What, ha what do you have at the output of a multi-layer processor? You just you don't just take a weighted sum of everything that happened earlier. You put it to an activation function, correct? So what you're really going to get is you're going to get something of this kind. You have some function here, not a threshold. It's going to be something else, and that function is going to have some range. Uh, so it's going to have go from say minus one to one or 0 to 1, 
or zero to infinity, whatever the final function is. So a multi-layered perceptron is really a function that maps from all possible input values to all possible output values. So in the case of the Boolean function, I can model any function going from you know uh, zero, one, raised to n to zero, right? In the case of uh, the, the uh, if you have threshold activations, threshold activations the outputs are either zero or one, correct? So this means this can model any function that goes from r raised to n to zero one. So if you have a sigmoid, the output lies in the range zero to one. This opens at zero one, right? This is so this can model any function that goes from r n to the set zero one. If I have a tan h, tan h, the output is in the close in the open set minus one one. So multi perceptron can model any function that goes from R n to minus one one. If the output final output is a is a, is a uh, value, the multi layer perceptron can model any function that goes from R n to zero infinity. Is the idea right? So, but in general, it is a uh, universal approximate for the entire class of maps that is represented. Okay. Final topic, business of depth and width. So in the previous discussion, we saw that a single layer MLP is a universal function approximator. It can approximate any function to arbitrary precision, but may require infinite neurons. Okay? And more generally, deeper networks will require far fewer neurons for the same approximation error. So we have shown any of these functions, if you have an error, if I fix the error, if I de deepen the network, I'm going to need fewer neurons and fewer parameters. Now, uh, and in fact, if I make the network deeper, it can be exponentially smaller for the same end. This is what we have said. This also this business of sufficiency, right? Now, look at this guy. A neural network, this two-layer neural network, we saw it in that was in this function, correct? Right? Provided that I have 16 neurons in the first layer, and 56 neurons in the second layer. And let's continue assuming a threshold function, right? Instead of 16 neurons, if I give you only eight neurons in the first layer, but I let you have infinite neurons in the second layer, can you model this function? Anyone? I'm still giving you the same thing. Now I'm letting you explore the size of the second layer, but I'm taking a few neurons off from the first layer. Can I model this guy? He said no. Anybody, everybody who said no, can you tell me why? You lose information, right? So if I give you only eight neurons over here, right? So let's say those eight neurons capture these lines. You're going to just have this information for each line. Is it to the right of the line or to the left of the line? So you can say it's to the right of this guy, it's to the left of this guy, but you can't say exactly where in between you are. Correct? There's no way you can go back in the next layer and pinpoint the location within that region and add a new threshold. That, that distinction is lost. So, not only is it necessary to have the right width, if you have less than the optimal width at any layer, it doesn't matter what you do thereafter. You screw. Right? So, now, same thing here. Suppose those eight neurons in the first layer capture these lines. Same thing. This is the best they can do. You're not going to be able to add it. You can color these boxes. You can't add new boxes. Right? So you need to have the optimal number of neurons in every layer. Okay. Now, no. uh, the usual input is two neurons, right? How can eight neurons lose information? The initial input is a continuous value of uh, input. Uh, Afterwards, it's been listed up the contrast. The information is gone, correct? Then we'll get to that. So, now, which means a neural network, network can represent any function provided it has sufficient capacity. If a net, if that is, if it's sufficiently broad in every layer, it's sufficiently deep in every layer. So here, for example, uh, in the second layer, instead of having 16 neurons, uh, excuse, or whatever, was, uh, was it 16? 46. If I chose to have only 45, can I get this figure? It's going to be lost. Okay? 
So, so uh, now, so why is this happening? This is happening because I need this really horrible assumption. I was going to talk using special functions. If I get rid of this one little assumption about only using threshold functions for my illustrations, what happens? So here is what happens as an effect of having threshold functions. So let's say I have only four neurons in the first layer, right? Then with those four neurons capture these four lines, this is the maximum amount of information being filtered through, right? You can say which region of the input stage the data are on. But within that region, you can make more distribution, right? So here you can say it is to the right of this guy, it's to the left of this guy, so it's in the yellow region. Where in the yellow region that information is coming? Which, is, which means that sub, the sub, rest of the network can color these boxes, the rest of the network cannot modify the boxes, right? Then, what can I do to fix this? Use the activation for signals. Thank you. Right? Exactly. So if I go from a threshold to a sigma, what happens? <clears throat> now the sigmoid begins to give me information about how far away I am from the boundary. Right? So over here, instead of just having a patch of yellow, I get a gradation. Something this color, right? Observe that this still screws me up. So in the sense that if I really wanted to get checkerboard boxes, and my first four guys only got these lines. There's never, I'm never going to be able to get any information about orthogonal segmentations, correct? Nevertheless, I can add lines in this region, but it's not that straightforward. So think of, think of something like this. If I just have thresholds, if I just have uh, a threshold activation, then I might have a line two lines, and I really don't see any distinction once I decide which side of the line I'm on. But instead of a threshold activation, I have something that is something like this. Right? Then I'm going to be able to make out some distinction in this region, and some distinction in this region. I still lose information in here. Right? So as I, which means, so how can I fix that? I can make my sigmoid wide. Correct. So if my sigmoid were like this, I can have you know, information about a wider range of values. Now the problem, of course, is that if I convert my sigmoid to a line, I've lost all, you know I've lost my fundamental nonlinearity. So the uh, you don't really want to, you want to be able to say that the space is warped, that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're taking decisions, but you don't want to lose information. So now, provided your activation is able to pass some information on to subsequent layers, you can still get away with having fewer than the required number of neurons in any layer, because the layer, subsequent layers can catch up and fill in the patterns because the information is still there. So given another, so given something of this kind, what would the best activation be? Something that carries, something that tells you there's a boundary, right? But still continues to give you information about where you are with respect to the boundary. Which is why, you know, the railways are really popular. If you're on the right side of the boundary, after that it gives you a continuous range of values. And if you use such activations, the width of the network will be very short as it is. You pass enough information to the downstream. Again, it's not black and white. Here, for example, I'm never going to be able to add lines that are orthogonal to this guy because that information is good. So, uh, narrow layers can still pass information to subsequent layers, provided the activation function is sufficiently graded, but you're going to need graded. So, and the same thing. Happens with every layer. Now, the so given all of this, we are speaking of how does a net we figure that a network can emulate any function, provided it's properly structured, it has the right number of neurons, it has the right width, it has the right depth, it has the right activation. Given all of this, 
Suppose somebody did give you a network. Can you quantify what class of functions the network can actually model? That it turns out is an impossible question. You get lots and lots of papers on the subject. Nobody really has an answer. So you want to define the capacity of a network. And you know, people have different definitions, information and storage capacity. How many patterns can it remember? We see that mention. What kind of complexity of uh, patterns can it uh, uh, can it actually model? The only thing that we know is that a network with insufficient capacity cannot model a you know, target function exactly. It might be able to model uh, approximate it to some error. It's never going to be able to model it. <coughs> so uh, uh, there are kind of various definitions. There's a bunch of there several definitions based on DC dimension theorem and sometimes back in uh, 98 shed showed that the linear threshold units the DC dimension is proportional to the of, of a network is proportional to the number of weights uh, this is uh, this is a more recent 1917 uh, uh, 2017 paper which uh, where they came up with DC dimension balance which is a good for these five million million but the point is, none of these are really going to give us any real definite answer. At some point, you're going to have to fall back on your intuitions about what the function looks like to design a network. Okay? So, this is just being didactic, nothing more. So, I'll stop right here with a lot of time. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Uh, but here is the summary. We saw multilayer perceptrons and universal Boolean functions. You might have heard a lot of uh, you know, gobbledygook about how they are universal approximators. We saw exactly how they are universal approximators. You can put the figures to it even if you have to do math. We saw how they can model the universal classifiers, the universal regressors. They can model any function to arbitrary precision given, provided we're able to make, we're going to make the network large, large enough. Yeah. And if you're not, if the network is of the wrong size or the wrong structure, then it's really going to be uh, very, you know, its its ability to model any given function is going to vary from being absolutely incapable to a you know, a physical approximation. So absolutely incapable. Let me think of a uh, an XOR function, right? When you have an XOR function, what is the special specialty of the XOR function? If I think of a one bit in an XOR function, what is the resultant function? How could it be? Accuracy of the resultant function? 50%, right? An XOR is an extremely unstable thing. You take away one bit, there and everything else is 50 percent so, so it can be that sensitive, which means that you never really know what you're going to get with these things, which is why they're not going to talk about them. You know, stop the questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were saying that, like, when you were talking at that set of room that they were talking about software. Yeah, but I mean, I, I checked the settings four times and it says it's making this. Maybe it's just the direction.